Are your speakers calibrated? These are. And what about your room? These speakers can fix it. So here I have the IK Multimedia iLoud Empty M Mark II, a pair. And hey, a calibration microphone as well. You can calibrate these speakers to suit your room. And what's not to like about that? Let's unbox. So what's special about these speakers? Why does the market need them? Who are they for? Where to start? These active speakers are tiny, tinier than your average bookshelf or near field monitor. And yes, the loud in the name isn't a mere boast. It's a threat. They can go very loud if you're foolish enough to want them to. And they have bass, way more than you'd expect for their size. The spec says only 10 dB down at 32 Hertz, which will be useful if you're into large-scale pipe organ music, or if you're into normal music, then you'll be delighted to be able to hear the fundamental pitch of the lowest string of a standard bass guitar. But what are you going to use them for? Well, it isn't hard to get the feeling that the iLouds might fulfill a similar role to a pair of Logitechs that you can buy from Amazon for less than 30 quid. But what's wrong with that? What's wrong with having a pair of speakers by your computer that will fully please your ears while you work on your spreadsheets and income tax forms? I think this is a perfectly valid use case. Home recording studio owners also will want to consider the eye louds as near field monitors. Briefly, near fields are monitors that are close to your ears, so you hear mostly direct sound and less of the acoustics of the room that you're in. They wouldn't need to be as small as they are for this kind of function, but small in size they may be, but definitely not small in sound. IK uses the phrase ultra near field. I don't mind that, but it kind of makes me wonder whether there could be ultra ultra near fields that are so close to your ears that they're almost headphones. Just a random thought there. As for hi-fi enthusiasts and audiophiles, well, speakers like these probably wouldn't be a first choice for your grand show-off listening room. But for a second system, well, yes, very possibly a consideration. Who wouldn't like decent sound in their kitchen, for instance? And I'm pretty sure that's a place where room calibration can help. Oh, not the bathroom. Not unless you want to risk winning a Darwin Award. Now, yes, the eye louds are small and mightier than they look. But what's special about them apart from that? MTM. Midwoofer, tweeter, midwoofer. Two midwoofers with the tweeter in the middle. Midwoofer? A woofer that can handle mids, and why not? MTM is also called the Dapolito configuration after Joseph Dapolito, who invented it. There's a bit of acoustic theory in this that a small sound source will tend to have a wide dispersion. A large sound source tends to have a narrow dispersion. A bit counterintuitive, but think of a line array PA system. It spreads the sound out over the width of the crowd, but focuses it in the vertical dimension to limit overspill. So the eye allowed spreads sound widely in the horizontal dimension and focuses it vertically limiting reflections from your desktop surface or mixing console if you're a high-end producer and from the ceiling. But it keeps the sweet spot wide so you don't need to put your head in a vice. Okay, that's talent number one. 
Talent number two, or in no particular order, is that you can calibrate the eye louts to your room. Room correction, in other words. Now, this is definitely a special thing. I'll say, as I've said many times before, that the only proper solution to room problems is for the room to be shaped such that it avoids, or avoids reinforcing, standing waves and acoustic treatment. But at the same time, not pumping so much energy into the room at frequencies that are going to make resonances kick off is a useful step to take. And this is what you get with the eye louds. Since the eye louds, active of course, are already packed with DSP, you can expect any issues with frequency response and resonances already to be ameliorated compared to a speaker that doesn't have all this fancy stuff. But with the calibration microphone, you can correct for your room too. You can do this the easy way, set up the mic, press a button on the speaker and it's done in seconds. No computer. Then do the other one. Or you can use the X-Monitor software for a presumably more accurate result and also more control. Don't worry, you can store the settings you create in the speakers, so no computer needed after that. OK, at this point I'm going to follow the path that interests me most, which is the calibration or room correction if you prefer to call it that. There's a lot of detail to these speakers and I've linked to IK's iLoud MTM Mark II page in the description where you can learn about voices, contours and other stuff that is interesting. But it's the calibration that's most interesting to me and I'm sure to my hi-fi enthusiast viewers. There are of course other reviews out there that may cover things I haven't included here. So what do the iLoud sound like out of the box? just using them as plain, active speakers, without any calibration. This is my setup where I make my irritating unboxing music, available on streaming and Bandcamp. You can see my audio interface, feel free to comment, my FlexiSpot standing desk and ergonomic chair, my 2018 vintage computer that runs my old software that my other, more recent Mac can't, my Fozzy V3 Class D amp, yes, Class D commenters. <laughs> a couple of other things and my Yamaha NS10M studio monitors. I say studio not because I'm giving my setup airs and graces, it's in the model name to distinguish them from the earlier NS10Ms, which weren't quite so studio-y. Those K&M stands, by the way, cost me 80 quid. 80 quid for two bits of bent metal. Now, if I say that I like my Yamahas, that says something about me and about my review of the iLouds. I suggest you balance that against my comments. I have to say that over the years I've become a bit of a closed box guy. Closed box as opposed to bass reflex. And the eye louds are of course reflex. Here's another pick, my bit of a lash up with the eye louds while I review them. And also consider whether the Yamahas were an error of my ways. If I were to decide to change to the eye louds, obviously I'd set up something a bit more appropriate. So what I have is the eye louds on top of my K&M stands and a couple of plastic crates that I've featured in a few other videos. Commenters just love to comment on them, so have yourself a field day. I have, of course, taken the precaution to put damping material inside. It's Charmin brand, and I've put my affiliate link in the description. I have to explain a little here. The eye louts come with desk stands that you can angle upwards so that the tweeters point directly at your ears. The manual is explicit that pointing directly at your ears must be so, otherwise you won't get the proper response. For me, I don't like sound coming up at me from the desk and that's just a personal preference. I like sound to come from head on, so that's what I've done and IK says it's okay. I suppose that to get K&M stands that will go that high, it's going to cost me more like 160 quid. Oh well. Something else that's relevant to your consideration of my comments is that the reflex ports are on the back of the eye louds, in just the right place to reflect from the walls. This, as you might expect, is not ideal. If I were to continue to use the eye louds, I'd definitely consider acoustic treatment here. And it would have to be more sophisticated than just a skinny bit of foam. So out of the box, the eye louds might sound a bit bass reflexy, exacerbated by the problems of your room. Or my room, possibly, to be more precise. But there's stuff to fix this. On the back of the eye louds, there are interesting buttons and LEDs. The first thing you might do is control the low frequency extension. 
So you can set a high pass filter at 80, 60, 50 hertz, or leave things as they are at 40. I don't think there's an actual filter at 40 hertz, that's just the natural roll off of the eye louds, as far as I can see. The 80 hertz setting is something you might use paired with a subwoofer, as commented in the manual. You can go further. There's also a high frequency EQ that can be flat, or shelving at 8 kilohertz and above. Plus 2 dB, minus 3. Not a lot, but not a lot should be needed. Also, there's more low frequency control with a similar shelf below 100 hertz. Flat, 2 dB up, or 3 dB down. Small changes, but you'll hear them, and quite possibly like what you hear following a bit of experimentation. There's also a desktop setting to compensate for reflections from a mixing console surface, which is a thing. But if you calibrate the eye louds, this won't be necessary. Two more. Sensitivity switchable for higher level pro signals, lower level home studio or domestic. And a volume control 6 dB up to all the way down. With a centre detent that in my opinion could be a little more detenty to avoid accidentally changing the setting. And on with the calibration and room correction. As I said, there's a quick way where you plug the calibration microphone into the speaker and long press on the cal slash preset button. The manual explains this nice and clearly. You do one speaker, then you do the other. Simple. But seeing as I've downloaded IK's X monitor software, I'm going to do it the long way, which I presume would be more accurate. Welcome to fun, fun, fun speaker calibration. Next, we have hardware setup, which explains in perfect crystal clarity what to do. Well, apart from having to connect both speakers to your computer with USB, which is explained in the manual, so that's OK. I could imagine that anyone who isn't familiar with microphones, and why should a hi-fi enthusiast be, they may see a conflict between facing upwards towards the ceiling and the microphone in the picture. Go with the picture, take a good look, and the capsule will end up in the right place, I'm sure. Now, room analysis. You're going to take four measurements in positions as shown in the graphic. Here's my setup with the microphone in position one. The mic on the left isn't doing anything. Now, do you see someone sitting in the chair? I'm going with the manual that says you should not be in the chair or anywhere near that would affect the measurement. When you click as instructed, you'll get a few seconds to walk away. Then you'll hear four sweeps like this. That's the actual sound recorded from the calibration microphone, and it is as quick as that. Move on to position two. When you've done all four points, you'll get a nice congratulatory message for your work, and why not? Next, you'll want to see the results. Here we are with befores and afters for both speakers. OK, that's a bit complicated, so let me show you just the left speaker. You can see from the green trace that there's a resonance at 50 Hz, and another around 160, 170, 180 or so, that the X monitor software has tamed admirably. I could, if I were so inclined, use this as a guide to what acoustic treatment I need to make sure that these resonances are less of a problem in the first place. I'd be able to calculate from the frequencies the distances between which pairs of walls are causing the issue. Then apply acoustic treatment tuned to these frequencies and apply it in the right places. Or I could just rely on the software and get on with making some more music. We also see a slight dip between 1 and 2 kHz, which it wouldn't surprise me if it were caused by my double glazed windows that are behind and to the left of my setup. But again, the software has corrected it well, as it has the slight roll off going up to 20 kHz. But I can't hear that, so I'm not going to worry. What puzzles me, though, is that the orange after trace shows a boost at around 35 Hz. Resonant frequency of the port? As things are, you or I might like these results. But remember I spoke about buttons and LEDs on the back of each speaker. You can use these to further tweak the response. For me, I often find too much bass a distraction while I'm working, rather than a help so I'd probably want to use the 50 or 60 hertz shelf option. Remember that this is my rather peculiarly shaped room, and your results may, will, vary. Don't forget that once you've calibrated, you don't need the computer. The corrections are stored in the speakers. 
What I think is that I don't want to seem to be telling you what you should think. These are just my personal opinions. Firstly, I'm going to use the iLouds going beyond this review and see how they shape up for me, considering that I'm using them for my music making, not for pleasure listening. They're a tool. But having said that, they're going to have to convince me to depart from my current closed box preference. And that's going to be a tough proposition. We'll see. Considering that, though, I commented earlier that to me the iLouds out of the box sounded a bit too reflexy, and also that their positioning in my room could be emphasising this. After calibration, however, things are very much improved. That boost at 35Hz, I can see it in the trace, but I'm not at all convinced I can actually hear it, and it's less in the right speaker. Or maybe it's just a quirk in my room that the software tried to fix, but couldn't quite do it. As for MTM, Dapolito and all that, yes, the sweet spot for listening is perfectly wide enough for me shuffling around in my chair. And the vertical focus, which works in theory, does also seem to work in practice. So imaging in the context of my music production is fine for me. I'll just say again that in consideration of my hi-fi enthusiast viewership, I haven't covered things that wouldn't be so relevant in that context. But anyone using the iLouds for production should definitely check out the voicing and contour options. As always, these speakers were sent to me, but other than that and any affiliate links, there's no payment or influence involved. So I can say what I like, and I've said it. See you soon.